So uh, generally, like little secret, like when when llamas are dramatic, look look in your own mind and see, right? Don't don't think just uh, outer. Or always think, you know, within the real. You know, is anger arising? So that's the you know real uh, abhidharma that in the moment we're able to say, oh, anger is arising in the mind, like that. Otherwise, it just becomes like a scholarly thing, right? You know, we're just kind of like, okay, here's what is this about? But um, the way to um, you know, really find out the nature of our mind is to put ourselves in situations where we're, we're open to um, you know, seeing things in a new way, right? But in general, um, uh, so uh, you just you just actually from you just kind of stay put like that. <laughs> so uh, uh, in the monastery, sometimes you know, like someone's talking fiercely to you, and, and the first thing to do actually is flight, right? We just want to run away. And the second thing is kind of fight back. And the third thing is freeze. The fourth thing is forget. And we make it fabricating things after that. So we just we just kind of stay right there, right? So that's very good. You guys just said, okay, meditate, you know, just and, uh, we can go forward. So uh, that's very good like that. But, yeah, but, uh, you know, it's still true, lamas enter the room, you have to just, like, go immediately silent, right, like that, just, um, but, um, uh, you, you just generally just stay put, that's the real shamatha, like, uh, so, uh, that, that we learn, like, you're just staying, okay, in anger, I'm just, I'm just staying there with it, right? So let's let's do uh, <laughs> let's do the Manjushri practice. Homage, homage to the. Can you hear me, friends? Okay. Homage to the Guru and the protector, Venerable Manjagosha. Your wisdom is brilliant and pure, like the sun. Free from the clouds of the two obscurations, you perceive the whole of reality exactly as it is, and so hold the book of transcendental wisdom at your heart. You look upon all beings imprisoned within samsara, enshrouded by the thick darkness of ignorance and tormented by suffering. With the love of a mother for her only child, your enlightened speech, endowed with the sixty melodious tones, like the thundering roar of a dragon awakens us from the sleep of destructive emotions and frees us from the chains of karma. Dispelling the darkness of ignorance, you wield the sword of wisdom to cut through all our suffering. Pure from the very beginning, you have reached the end of the ten bhumis and perfected all enlightened qualities, foremost of the Buddha's heirs. Your body is adorned with the 112 marks of enlightenment. To Manja Gosha, the gentle voice, I prostrate and pray, dispel the darkness from my mind. Oma Rapasanati, Oma Rapasanati, Oma Rapasanati, Oma Rapasanati, Oma Rapasanati, Oma Rapasanati, Oma Rapasanati.
Oh my representative with all of your kindness and love let your wisdom is shining light clear the darkness of my ignorance once and for all Grant me, I pray, the intelligence, the brilliance to understand the scriptures, the words of the Buddha, and the works of the masters. And whenever I wish to look upon you or ask of you anything at all, Lord and Protector Manjushri, let me see you without any hindrance. Get up. Is it too low? Is it okay? Yeah, all right. <clears throat> so, uh, in order to understand the benefit from these discussions, it's um, it's absolutely necessary to do uh, our training uh, on the cushion, because as long as the mind is still speedy. Uh, well, we, we just run right past the truth. The mind is going too fast. So uh, if, if we just kind of waved a hand in front of our face, all we see is a bear, right? <clears throat> or someone's waving their hand in front of our face, just blur. So we have to slow it down. Slow, slow, slow. If we, if we get to really, really stop, then it's going to be as clear as possible, right? He, you know, then, then you can see the lines, you know, like, oh, there's my lifeline. Oh, I might die soon, you know, but there's that. So, but, you, you know, so you'd see the real detail, really, when it stopped. You can see every little thing. But actually, you know, in doing what's called our shine or calm abiding practice and slowing down the mind, it, it doesn't always have to come to a complete stop, right? Because people get discouraged you know, thinking, oh, I really have to come to complete, stable, clarity, complete, um, uh, cessation, right? Actually, we don't. But you have to slow it down enough to go, oh, there's someone waving a hand in front of my face. What a jar. And then, so that's, that's shamatha, right? It's slow down enough so the mind is stable enough that it can recognize, okay? The, the passion of the superior seeing autonomy or panoramic, uh, that's when you go, oh, that's, that's my hair. No one's, no one else is leaving. You know, we're all mad. Stop waving. Her face. Oh, that's, you know, I'm doing that. So um, that is the positive recognition, you could say, of self. Like, uh, the mind is seeing the mind. <laughs> However, we also have to. Uh, recognize these persistent but relative states of mind is thinking that uh, someone else is doing it. So when we have this someone else is doing it feel, um, then that's when the skandhas are taken to be the self. So Someone else is doing it, so there must be someone else um, that's it's being done to, right? So we, we, we think that um, the skandhas, the form, the feeling, the perception, composition of factors or emotions and consciousness 
um, are objectively real so that I must be real. So to start with, we have to get in touch with that experience of grasping onto the skandhas as being real and being self. It isn't that we see the skandhas as unreal and then we have a solid self. We see them actually as real. So we must have a self or they must be the self. Usually, as Wasabha uh, uh, points out, we usually see um, consciousness as the self and the other skandhas as something that the self owns. But the primary problem is we, we somehow uh, see like there's a lot of that. So there has to be a me and it's with me. Uh, the other is the me. But it starts out with that spirit. <laughs> so you have to slow down. Doing this reading is really important because it tries to break it down for us. Also, so creating a sense of self, a sense of identity that is confusing. But without actually doing the yogic practice, it just becomes kind of um, a list, right? So we absolutely must see uh, how quick everything happens and basically want to slow it down. That's why when even difficult phenomena come up, you just want to sit there. So, uh, Greg Will Bicky's uh, chiming in here. We're having a good discussion today. So he's saying, I just want to do something about it. I don't like it. I want to push it away. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're getting some a lot of data here from Greg. So, yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't think you're plugged in, are you? Okay, now I'm plugged in. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to say that Lama behaved today just like my ex-wife behaves, and I got exactly <laughs> the same reaction. And I really don't like that reaction, and I want to do something with it. I want to make it go away. So, do I really have to just sit with it? Is is there any release from this, or like you know? I guess that's the stupid question. So there it is. So, uh, from the Dharma point of view, we want to bring it inside and see what it is before we do something about it. But uh, we have to do that first in a very perfect situation, which is called uh, a meditation session, where um, we don't have to do anything. So that's why it's absolutely essential we have a spot in our house or some place where for a period of time, hopefully a long period of time, we don't have to do anything. We can just examine it. Eventually we do have to do something, of course, right? So eventually, uh, you have to get up and have a glass of water, go to the bathroom at least, right? <laughs> Stretch your legs. Okay, that's cheating, but I agree. <laughs> uh, but you, you have to come to you know, some slowing down, right? And come to some recognition.
that we come to some kind of recognition that uh, we're treating uh, our experiences very solid. Because this is moving so fast, solid. And therefore, in response, we become solid. And we have to um, somehow be suspect. Maybe it's not quite that way. Okay, sounds good. I'll work on it. Greg said he'd work on it. <laughs> if, if we meditate long enough, all uh, the various um, experiences will arise on their own. And this is why it's essential to do uh, long training, long sitting, not just daily, but um, to do retreat. If you're on retreat and things are ideal, um, you'll find, well, there's nothing really to get angry about. Yeah. But you'll find that you know, the anger is going to arise in it. That should be a big wake up, right? And just our daily practice, we're noticing even frustration and what is uh, uh, <laughs> you know, that's the surface level of anger. It'll just arise. And you usually think, oh, that person made me angry, that situation isn't right, I'm not doing things right. Um, it's not coming from outside. That takes a lot of practice to kind of go, it's not coming from outside. I'm not saying they're not outside things or outside people misbehaving, right? But the anger is coming from the side, do you agree? <laughs> <clears throat> Sometimes um, we think, well, we, we need, and I say we do need to do long retreats and long meditations, but actually um, uh, most of us have uh, responsibilities, right? So we need to count ourselves lucky when in the first few minutes we're feeling restless. Then we can go, that's great. I didn't have to do a three month or three year retreat get, to get in touch with my anger. It's right there. <laughs> <laughs> so Abhidharma style um, is very directly related to Mahamudra and Dzogchen style because we're just looking uh, right away at anger. We're not thinking what is the cause of the anger right away. We're not thinking, uh, you know, uh, I'm angry because of this or that history or anything. There's no history in Abhidharma. Did you find any history? Some of you maybe actually made it into the text. There's no, once upon a time, there were these skandhas, <laughs> once upon a time, there were these factors of so forth. <laughs> So uh, immediately, if we label things and recognize and then investigate our relationship with that phenomena, it will change. But we can't be immediately reactive or the tendency is we, we won't see it. <clears throat> there are times are where we should be responsive. So uh, we're not going to have good relationships if we just say the whole point is to be non-reactive, right? But non-reactive in the Buddhist sense means we're not acting unconsciously. 
we want to respond consciously with awareness and wisdom, with Manjushri. Because Manjushri's uh, form is that uh, we're holding up a flaming sword, is that an absolute or relative phenomena? Anybody? It's relative phenomena. You could say it louder. <laughs> Use the microphone. Relative. Yeah. Matthew said relative. Do you guys hear that? So. What does one Jishui really look like? That's relative, right? What's the what's the ultimate really look like? No. Empty, yeah. Doesn't look like anything. You just see right through it. The nature of the mind uh, doesn't have any color or shape, but it can be recognized. It can know. Do you think we can recognize our own mind? Yeah, we can. But Abhidharma definitely is learning to recognize relative states first. Isn't that true? That's anger. And we don't run away or fight. We don't create a story or a fabrication about it. We just look deeply within it, right? And what do we find? Anybody? Nothing. So we don't find we, when we search deeply. We don't find we don't find the emotion or whatever. Um, is that am I on the right track? Or That's no? a little nihilistic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anybody could hear you. You're whispering. Oh. Okay. No, no, no. So uh, what, what we find is we, we find that it doesn't exist the way it normally appears. That doesn't mean nothing. When we look deeply into the anger, we find that it doesn't exist the way it seems, and we don't exist the way it seems. But that doesn't mean nothing's there. What, what has to be there? <laughs> They're all kind of good answers in a way. So uh, <laughs> just stay with the Buddha nature. Then, okay. That's a good one. That's a good one. You're good. Okay. That covers it. That's like everything. Like, <laughs> so we're, we're going to see the nature of awareness and the nature and anger at the same time. It isn't that the anger disappears like poof, right? It's just, it doesn't turn into an other and we don't form uh, a self around it. When we say when we don't feel a self around it, we don't create an Atman around it that perceives itself as being permanent, to be outside of the skandhas, outside of mind, that owns it, that can control it, that pervades through all of it, right? Instead, when we look directly at our experience, we, what do we find? We find a relative self that comes about through causes and conditions, and relative anger that comes about through cause and conditions, neither of which is uh, solid or exists on its own side. It becomes more workable. It becomes actually more appropriate. It becomes less reactive. Maybe it does totally dissipate. Sometimes doing retreats <laughs> with people, like, we're really mad, or sometimes at home with people, we're really mad, 
and then there's a recognition of the absolute and the relative, and we burst out laughing. Probably sometime in the past, we were so incredibly angry that we thought it would never end, right? That, that real visceral experience. I'm not talking about the resentment, but just the actual real, like, I can't even think straight. Um, leaving the house or <laughs> quitting the job or something. Is it there now? Can't be because you're here. <laughs> it seems so absolute and solid at the time, didn't it? <clears throat> but of course, uh, there are subtle traces called resentment. So that's why later we're going to talk about uh, the storehouse consciousness, right? Alia, Vichnana, which is still a divided consciousness. It's not uh, jhana, alaya, but just vijnana, so subject object consciousness. So it does leave residue, right? So if we get generally past, even when we see that uh, the nature mind, uh, even when we see the essential emptiness or non-substantiality of the anger, uh, let me ask you this, does, does it leave uh, a trace or a seed in the Alia consciousness? What do you think? Okay, Greg Wobicki votes, yes. <laughs> How about someone uh, remotely? What do you say? Do you, can you hear me okay? Is it leaving? Does it leave any subtle traces? So, okay, like Morris is going this way and Derek's going this way. Ellen's going subtle traces. I, I think it does. It's like a, leaves a smell in the house. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Of course, like everything um, in our tradition, it depends upon the point of view and the school that, in which we're looking at, right? So, uh, but generally, um, uh, so from one point of view, we could say there's no traces. We could say that from one point of view, right? Because traces would have to be you know, uh, found as separate traces, right? We go looking for a separate trace, but we find it. That would be Madhyamaka style, right? But even Nagarjuna said, uh, my emptiness doctrine doesn't um, uh, cancel out uh, karma, doesn't cancel out uh, relative truth. It just sees relative as relative, right? Generally, uh, since I can't get a discussion out of you guys quite, uh, <laughs> uh, generally we kind of err on the um, on the side of caution, saying probably, <laughs> probably there's still going to be some relative seeds that will eventually sprout. When they sprout, you may be able to see their essential relativity, their essential emptiness, their essential luminosity. But um, uh, generally, we're going to say probably uh, some things are, to be safe, probably some things are going to sprout at some point. Like, there's going to be a few weeds in the garden, even though have lovely um, you know, uh, geraniums. No one, no one plants geraniums anymore, do they? Who plants dahlias here? Anybody? Good man. <laughs> yeah. Those, those take a lot of work, and then they're just awesome dahlias. So 
it is possible that um, we are also planting dahlias and uh, even though the weeds, there's some weeds around dahlias, they're, they're so high, right? Usually you have to put some kind of a stick or something, right? Keep them upright. So, yeah, we'll just do that. Um, so uh, with mature Dharma practitioners, we realize that uh, we might, we're growing dahlias or um, wonderful lotuses or uh, what, what, what did the Japanese emperors like? It's the symbol of the Japan, Japanese imperial chrysanthemums, right? So we need flowers too. But even with that kind of garden of our lotuses, chrysanthemums, and dahlias, we're probably going to have to continue to weed. I don't know any teacher that's still not doing training. I've told this story many times. When I had a few discussions with uh, Chad Rinpoche, his wonderful teacher, completely honest, he said, well, yeah, I still get angry. I'm working on it. <laughs> if you want to read mature practitioners, uh, they're always going to say, I'm working on developing some new patients. It is encouraging. So, uh, and sometimes when people say, oh, I don't get angry anymore, <laughs> I, I generally can say I, I'm good at making people angry a little bit. <clears throat> Lama, we do have a, a question from online here. Online. Hello, onlineers. Uh, it's from Jessica. Could the subtle traces be equated to imprinted, imprinted memory? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, What's, what's interesting in um, Buddhist Abhidharma and these kind of discussions is that um, the karmic traces do not have to be connected with memory. Whereas um, usually Western psychology, trauma work particularly, right? We end up talking about memory a lot, memory, you know, body memory, muscle memory, um, you know, just regular old synapse memory, stuff like that. But the um, deep uh, Aliya consciousness is not actually a memory system. So that's controversial, right? Because um, uh, Tsongkhapa, for example, uh, a little bit critical of the Alia. Like, well, um, you say, you know, like they're going to be stored somewhere. If you say something is going to be stored somewhere, then where is it stored, right? You say, well, there are these seeds. And then you say, well, where is, because that's the metaphor you use, right? So where's the storehouse? You know, is it in the Midwest? You know, is it West Sacramento? You know, where where is it stored, right? If we're New Age, we say in the Akashic records. Right? <laughs> so where where do you find that, right? So um, actually, there's very little um, um, about uh, stored memory the same way we talk about. Union unconsciousness uh, or stored things like that that actually there could be a store so um, uh, me the memory aspects if you if you look up memory um, 
which I haven't even done in this book from Artemis, which is quite um, detailed. Nothing, nothing on memory, zero. This is a good question to Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Are you out there? Can you hear? Yeah. Um, so, uh, why, why generally don't we, you know, because uh, why don't we talk that much about memory sometimes in this style of Dharma? We need a doctoral thesis on that, don't we? Yeah, because um, uh, generally we would say, you know, we, we recognize things in people, we remember uh, what we're doing um, when we're doing mindfulness, right? We remember to be mindful or um, past memories seem to come up usually like let's let's hope usually they're nice <laughs> sometimes not so nice but we attribute that to um an experience owned by an owner right but uh in buddhism we'd say well there's no, we can't we can't say that the memory is owned by an owner so when we say that memories are owned by an owner uh, they take on uh, a different function, uh, and particularly in Yogacara, than, than memories. They take on uh, karmic traces. So, uh, can I can I add something into that? Because you, no, just... you can speak up, then I could hear you. Oh, okay. I'll try. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. So you said karmic traces, and the the closest thing that I could find in my own understanding to that is um, like DNA memory and that type of memory that can be intergenerational. And so it's just me trying to make sense of this of my own understanding. Well, I I think some people have talked about it from that DNA style in the sense that. Um, we can't say we personally remember, you know, we don't, we don't think of DNA as memory, right? But in a sense, it is our, a, a kind of memory, isn't it? Because we're passing on these uh, tendencies, passing on, you know, a whole bunch of stuff, right? But we, we can't say we personally remember it. So, um, of course, and, um, Ancient India, they didn't uh, have DNA, um, but they had um, a whole other system of the body and mind, um, which uh, you know came out in the tantras, right? So that's why uh, when we study the tantras, uh, in very detailed ones, um, the Dzogchen tantras, even. Uh, as Jack knows, the uh, the root tantras is extremely detailed, just like Kala Chakra, uh, the Yagarbha is, you know, very very detailed, don't you think, Dirk? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like what's going on there. Well, that's uh, that's our Buddhist way of talking about our DNA. Like that these are kind of passed along. And sometimes Theravada Buddhism, uh, you know, is thought of as Hinayana, but Hinayana is, a, is just a way we practice, not a school. So um, there's a very famous text called the, that was translated early on by somebody British called The Questions of King Melinda, right? He was a Greek uh, uh, from uh, Alexander the Great. And this king, who was Greek, had questions of, uh, this monk. So the monk was trying to um, talk about memory and traces. And uh, the classic Indian metaphor is a seal in wax. So the seal 
um, leaves an impression on the wax, but nothing is transferred. So we have Mahamudra, we have great seal. So that's kind of interesting, right? So an impression is transferred, but it's not, would you call that a memory? When we make a copy of a text in a copier well, machine, is it? There's still an ex there's still an experience around that if you're. Oh, sorry. That is an experience around it, which could then connect. Like as soon as it starts to express itself in an experience, then it would create a connection to the the memory. Like the the memory existing in one's own mind you can't hear me That's i didn't fine. catch that much i'm sorry because uh, uh, uh say it say it a little bit again jessica we can you're talking about yeah, seal. can you hear me yeah better now yeah okay you're talking about seal and the wax and creating an, an impression right and whether or not there's a memory involved in that. Right. And so are you looking at the seal in the wax? Or that's the part that I don't understand. Yeah. How do you say it? it's a mem if you're looking at it, like how does it become a memory or not a memory if it's just an object or somebody looking at the object? Are you remembering it the next day after you saw it? So uh, your questions point out how difficult it is to pinpoint what actually is memory, right? And also, you know, uh, how, how uh, information is passed on. Is it passed on through memory actually, or is it passed on in another way? So I think one of the reasons um, uh, we don't discuss um, memory in the sutra system is it's too difficult. And uh, that's one of the reasons we evolve higher teachings like Mahamudra and Tantra and Dzogchen, because it's almost impossible. This is Buddhist idea, could be, you know, maybe not true. Uh, it's very, it's almost impossible to describe the functioning of memory from uh, a sutra level. Sutra level means you could explain it as if it was uh, uh, an objective thing that you could say, here's how memories move and here's how, uh, you know, we can call this memory or call that impression. We waded into some deep rivers here, didn't we? I'd like to come back to this, you know. Um, <clears throat> um, but right now, uh, we have to move on. Can you remind me to come back to this, Jessica? Absolutely. So who? I can't hear. Yes. Can you hear the yes? Yes. Okay. It's simpler from the standpoint of a pedagogical standpoint to uh, treat when we're um, doing a meditation training in a safe environment where we don't have to do anything, to treat it as if everything was totally happening in the now and there's no memory. Um, the Abhidharma style that we have here from transitional, but it's still pretty much like um, the Sarvastavadin or Sardantika style Ignaga where moments 
you know, uh, condition the next moment. But you know, like the seal, nothing is passed over. So uh, the fact that one moment of mind moment is uh, essentially the same as the preceding moment, um, we're not calling memory. Just like uh, the chair is continuing to look like a chair through uh, a momentary process. But we're not saying that the chair remembers having a chair. You have to use the microphone. I'm sorry. Does that mean when you have a memory? It seems it's kind of like it's happening again, in a way. <clears throat> when it seems like it's happening again, um, a little bit from one perspective, we could say that's trauma. When it seems like it's happening fresh, Okay. But people, a lot of people have trauma just all the time. No way. That's called samsara, yeah. Okay. Samsara is like unending horrific trauma, right? But we'll have to come back. This is really important how uh, we work with memory in, in a relative way, because we say it all the time and how it might exist on different levels. But when we're thinking from an Abhidharma point of view, we're um, identifying experiences um, that, in a sense, uh, rise in each moment. So they're not a memory of the previous moment, but a new moment. That at the same time has generally similar characteristics or absolutely the same characteristics. And we would call that permanent. So, um, I hope this talk was kind of interesting. <laughs> huh? Started out interesting, yeah. So. So I don't know people in the uh, virtual. So uh, I came in and they didn't stand up; they were chattering. So I walked out again and waited. Did people know that? We didn't know that. Uh, so uh, he said, "Okay, meditate." So I wanted to see what would happen, you know. And then I saw what would happen. Uh, one person walked out but everyone else stayed. So that's why when I initially came, I said, okay, when we get a strong phenomena, particularly in training, um, where things really are safe, because actually the temple here is quite safe. Everyone here is very safe. It's wonderful people. So then, then we can look directly at some phenomena, particularly uh, anger, which is one of the most destructive and difficult to work with. We'll usually say that in Tantra. Lowriyana they say desire is the most difficult. Actually, ignorance is the most difficult, but um, uh, usually anger, uh, anger is the more destructive. Usually we want to preserve what we desire, right? But in anger, you don't want to preserve something. You just want it to go away. <laughs> so uh, I want to actually have another second talk Sunday about um, Abhidharma in more detail and the process uh, style of uh, Stephen Goodman. So uh, Elizabeth Zeem and I are going to work on that a little bit more. So I, I really love her um, you know, PowerPoint presentations. Don't you guys all love it? Give her a hand. Yeah. <laughs> it's 
totally a great way than uh, picking some of the um, the photos and scenes is really unique. I, I like that. <clears throat> Working with our direct experience and seeing deeply into the, both the relative and absolute nature of our experience is, is liberation. So because we only have a little bit of time, we try to make our experience very vivid, even in training, right? So uh, we do talk about relaxing, which means slowing down and allowing and looking, but then there's the urgency of seeing what it actually is. So uh, I'll leave you with a paradoxical, you need to slow down and look intensely at the same time. Be utterly transparent and investigative at the same time. So be utterly obvious and be nosy at the same time. <laughs> Some of you like to be a little nosy in here. I like that. Any, any other comments from, uh, long distances away? Washington, Pennsylvania, Atlanta, Loomis. <laughs> Mama, I have a question, but I'm afraid you can't hear me well. Can you hear me? Yes. And maybe it's too big of a question for where we are tonight, but you said that Sankapa doesn't buy into the storehouse concept. So I'm wondering how Sankapa or other Madhyamakas, what the mechanism is for karma. How does cause lead to effect over time if there's no storehouse? Uh, I wouldn't say it doesn't exactly uh... Uh, by in, uh, I think uh, I would say he he raises some uh, critical objections, um, but uh, like many things with Sankapa and uh, other teachers, uh, uh, at one point in their writings or contemporary even now will say yes, one day and no, then another. So uh, I, if I was a really good scholar, I, I would bring up all those citations for you right away. Uh, in general, though, it's uh, uh, sometimes when people are um, a little bit too uh, objectifying or too reifying uh, the the storehouse consciousness idea, instead of being liberating, becomes a burden, right? So I think uh, Tsongkhapa, like the other wonderful teachers, are pointing to the essential purity aspect of the mind uh, and not to get totally um, depressed about um, all our latent karmic imprints, right? That can be depressing. We might start thinking that um, the dahlias will be overcome by, you know, like a little shop of horrors kind of plant that will grow up. So uh, uh, it's always important, completely important in Dharma to always come back to uh, seeing the balance of absolute and relative. Um, and most importantly, to see things exactly the way they are, to recognize that they appear one way, but examination, they, they're another way, and to realize the wisdom line. That's why we do uh, a magician practice. We must have the wisdom to see things as they are. So uh, when we're talking about these relative states of mind, even the skandhas, uh, these heaps, or these aggregates do, do they exist ultimately? Yes, no. Skanda's absolute or relative truth? What? Relative. Now we're getting some more consensus. Okay. So. Um, Lama, aren't they even more than just relative? Aren't they uh, conceptual? 
<clears throat> yeah, so that's a good question. So um, as the scholars in the Sangha know from a Madhyamakan point of view, there's really just uh, you know, emptiness and conventional, right? But, uh, even though I'm very fond of Madhyamaka uh, stylistically, um, uh, in Yogacara we say there's uh, the absolute nature, then there's the true relative, and then there's the delusional. So uh, skandhas would be like along that line of like true relative. True relative is we can find uh, the rabbit, but we can't find uh, the jackalope. We're not gonna find the rabbit with the horns, right? But, but even the true relative, when, when it's conceptually designated like that, it, it, it's still uh, really a, a useful fiction to uh, describe something. I think, anyway, I'm getting it. My, this is my idea of Tsongkhapa's criticism of the yes. Alaya Vijnana, is that it's, that it's not, it's not something that you can point to. Right, yes. It appears that, yeah, we should be, you know, like it's much easier to point to, uh, uh, you know, some, some relative things rather than others, right? Uh, the um, uh, the skandhas ultimately can't be found, uh, but uh, are, as Dirk was saying, um, useful and perhaps healing fictions, so that um, they're a more useful way of actually seeing how our mind and body actually are, instead of conceiving of as an Atman that owns certain mental states. So uh, it's an analytic breakdown that hopefully is skillful and uh, does have uh, some functionality and usefulness. For those who read Dharmakirti, um, we know that uh, Dharmakirti particularly liked um, things, uh, if they were functional, they uh, existed. If they didn't have any function, they didn't exist. In fact, Vasubandhu kind of goes on that rap um, by saying, well, uh, we can't call space an element, right? Because <laughs> it doesn't seem to have any function. I felt like kind of like, that's a bummer. <laughs> I've always liked space, you know, we're always trying to be spacious and come on, like, so, you know, <laughs> So no, he's talking. You know, he's talking earth, water, fire, and air, wind, right? The four elements. And sometimes we say, well, as if there's another element, space, or maybe another element, consciousness, right? But he's saying, well, space doesn't do anything, so uh, it's just the mere absence. So we can't call it an element. What do you guys think? Don't you? Do you like space having? I think element? space. I think space gives the other element something to uh, be in. It provides the function of allowing them to exist. I know. So we should have a debate with Vasubandhu about that, don't you think? <laughs> yes, we should. Uh, what uh, we're trying to do in the Buddha Dharma study group and trying to do with ourselves and Sangha members is to actually, by uh, reading the words of these teachers, to bring out our own unexamined ideas and to examine them, you know, in contradistinction to their ideas. We don't have to agree all the time, right? But when somebody puts something on the table saying, this is the way I think it is, then we get something to work with. So for all of us uh, in the song, we, we can, you know, I mean, if you want to say, I believe the Atman is real and the earth is flat and the sun goes around a flat earth, we can say, okay, let's, let's talk about that, right? <clears throat> but uh, can you back that up with arguments? Can you back that up with, uh, you know, actual experience? And if we tried to experiment with that, what would happen? So 
I'm sure if Fasabanda was here, we we uh, we could say he's kind of here, and um, maybe we could have a debate about the space, right? Of course, when we're using space uh, in the Dzogchen sense, we're we're using it a little bit different than physical space, don't you think? Okay, it's a little after eight, so um, you've been most attentive. And um, uh, for really, for me, if I'm really doing the practice, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really developing this strong interest in how my actual experience manifests, right? And uh, the Abhidharma, even though it's kind of dry, uh, in some ways, it can point to the direction of our actual lived experience. Just like our anatomy helps, uh, knowledge of anatomy helps uh, my massage therapist, Matthew, give a better massage, don't you think? <laughs> but my body doesn't look like, <laughs> like an anatomy class, right? I still have the skin on it, right? Thank you. Thank you for listening, everybody. Really appreciate um, uh, everybody's practice. And um, hello up in Kingston. <laughs> and Santa Rosa and uh, San Jose, Livermore, right? Yeah, like that. We'll see you all soon. So let's do closing. Uh, So we'll do dedication. Yeah. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rizig, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Dragpa, I make requests at your holy feet. I'd like to thank our folks in the uh, tech booth. Uh, Daniel and Dylan, thank you so much for today. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so uh, it, it's working, right? So, yeah, a little bit like that. Okay, but uh, we're continually making improvement in our tech world. Uh, so I look forward to this year, just maybe some uh, new microphones. Okay, so I'll see some of you later this week be teaching this Sunday. Ciao. Thank you so much. Oh, la, la. Oh, la, la. Thank you, Lama. Thank you, Lama. Hello, hello, testing. Are you loud and clear? All right, great. We are going to try to figure out why we had a lot of that buzzing and a lot of that weird feedback. Um, the first issue might have been because we logged into the wrong account with one of our 
computers. Uh, so I'm going to test that out first. We may not be able to keep this meeting uh, running if we leave with this account. So can I ask you guys to join back in and maybe about 60 seconds if there is a disconnect. Yeah, did you end the recording? Okay. Uh, yeah, I will definitely do that. Thank you for reminding me.